Let's continue with the descending tracks. I already showed you this picture as well. Here uh, we repeat that basically there are somatomotor and visceral motor uh, pathways. The visceral motor I'm not going to touch today because this is going to be discussed in detail when we talk about the autonomic nervous system. Uh, we are going to focus on the uh, uh, pyramidal and extrapyramidal tracts which go through or start or begin in the brainstem, just like uh, when we discuss the uh, spinal cord pathways. So just like the um, ascending tracts, you can see that uh, we can group uh, the tracts into pathways that go through the brainstem and or begin in the brainstem. But more important is according to the different functions. So I'm going to start with the pyramidal uh, tract. Here, when we say pyramidal, we mean both uh, those fibers that go down to the spinal cord, this is the corticospinal tract, or uh, those and those which end in the brainstem, in the brainstem motor nuclei. These motor nuclei are the trigeminal, the facial, glossopharyngeal vagus, and the hypoglossal nuclei, which uh, respectively um, innervate the muscles of mastication, facial expression, larynx, pharynx, and tongue. These obviously need a supranuclear innervation too, and this is the corticonuclear tract, or also called corticobulbar tract. So here uh, I'm going to show you the corticospinal tract first that goes through the brainstem in the mesencephalon, in the middle of the peduncle. Then in the, in the uh, pons, the fibers are scattered and form more like a, a loose corticospinal tract. They become compact again in the medulla of the uh, pyramid, uh, in the medullary pyramids, and then there is the medullary, <coughs> the pyramidal decussation in the medulla, the lower level of the medulla, and then we have the lateral and anterior corticospinal tract. The lateral is obviously going in the lateral follicle of the spinal cord. Uh, these are the fibers that already cross at the level of the medulla, and the anterior uh, tract is the one that is not crossed at the level of the medulla, only crosses at the level of the innervation. So this we have already discussed the spinal cord uh, part and now we are going to focus on the corticonuclear tract uh, which goes to the motor nuclei of the brainstem. This uh, picture shows that most <coughs> motor nuclei have bilateral innervation. Bilateral innervation. So it's like evolutionarily the face is over secured <coughs> that it's going to get uh, innervation. So the descending pathway here you can see gives uh, innervation to both sides. And this is very important clinically because if one side is lesioned, the muscle is still going to be uh, intact because it receives innervation from the other side too. Except, and here you can uh, see the exceptions, and this is something you have to know. So, except the lower muscles innervated by the facial nerve, uh, except the uh, genioglossus muscle innervated by the hypoglossal nerve, and the uh, uvulary muscle innervated by the vagus, this receives innervation only from the other side. And the lesions can be uh, supra nuclear or uh, peripheral lesion. This, I already mentioned that the spinal cord lectures and the upper motor neuron or the lower motor neuron is lesioned. So let's see first the facial nerve palsy, which is a must know. So this is going to be asked in the exam. You have to know the difference between uh, peripheral and central facial nerve palsy, facial nerve lesion. So as you see in this very uh, simple example, this is the facial nerve nucleus. Uh, <coughs> inside this nucleus, uh, the different uh, motor neurons going to different muscles uh, are differently positioned. So you can see that the upper muscles have uh, bilateral innervation. The lower muscles have only unilateral innervation coming from the other side. 
So, um, you can simplify it. Muscles around the eye and forehead have bilateral innervation. Muscles around the uh, mouth have unilateral innervation. Why is this clinically very important? If you have a central lesion here, for example, in the internal capsule, descending fibers uh, of the corticonuclear tract are lesioned, then you can see that only the uh, muscles around the uh, mouth and the lower eyelid will be uh, uh, paralyzed because the muscles of the forehead and eye get bilateral innervation, so it still has uh, an innervation in this part of the nucleus. In peripheral lesion, if the nerve itself or the whole nucleus is damaged, obviously those muscles will be uh, paralyzed. Uh, here you can see another picture basically showing the same uh, thing. If we have central lesion, once more, only the lower muscles are affected and on the contralateral side. Uh, if you have a peripheral lesion, like in this case, there is a tumor, acoustic neuronoma, and then uh, half of the face is basically lesioned on the same side. All the muscles are affected. And plus, at the end of uh, the semester, so in, for the exam, you will learn other functions of the facial nerve, and you will have to list all uh, the lesions, all the signs of the facial nerve palsy. You already know taste that through the corda tympani, facial nerve uh, is involved in, uh, in taste, uh, anterior two thirds of the tongue, and of course, this will be lost too. And many times, this is the first symptom, first sign of a facial nerve palsy. Why? Because this, these are sensory fibers and these are very thin uh, fibers, uh, the myelin sheath is much thinner than of the motor uh, nerves which have very thick myelin sheath. So many times this is uh, what the patients first not notice that they uh, cannot uh, taste the food. Then uh, this uh, is something you don't know yet but we will uh, do this when we do the ear. The hyperacusis uh, is a symptom which means that you are too sensitive to uh, loud noises and uh, this is because the facial nerve also innervates the stapedius muscle responsible for the stapedius reflex which is a reflex that protects our inner ear against very loud noises and this uh, uh, you already learned it a little bit but when we uh, do the eye you will hear it again that through the greater petrosal nerve which is also a branch of the facial nerve Facial nerve also innervates the lacrimal gland, so it's responsible for tear production. So this is all lost in uh, facial nerve palsy. And these are very important when we look at um, the peripheral lesion, when the patients cannot, clo uh, cannot close the eye. It's very important, many times uh, this is mixed up in the exam too. So uh, facial nerve innervates the orbicularis oculi muscle, which closes the eye. So if this is lesioned, of course the patient is not able to close the eye. And then this together with the previously discussed decreased tear production uh, is a very bad thing for the eye. The eye can easily dry uh, out. Here you can see that on this side, uh, this patient has lost all muscle activity. In contrast, in the central lesion, uh, the patient is still able to wrinkle uh, the forehead and can close the eye, which is very important functionally. Uh, the other such nerve which receives unilateral innervation, uh, supranuclear innervation, is the uh, uvulary muscle innervated by the vagus nerve. Here you can see that it's diagnostically important because when you look into the patient's throat, uh, you can see the asymmetry of the uvula and the soft palate, so it's a, it has a diagnostic importance. Not so much the loss of the uvulary muscle is important, but the diagnostic importance. And the third such nerve that has 
on the unilateral innovation, supranuclear innovation, is the genioglossus muscle, uh, which is innovated by the hyperglossal nerve. And in these examples, you can also see that the tongue is moved to one side, the genioglossus muscle is responsible for sticking the tongue out. So you stick the tongue out and on one side it's paralyzed, then uh, the normal genioglossus will pull uh, the tongue to that side. And if it is present for long term, you can see that there is atrophy of the muscles too. Uh, finally, let's see the brainstem reflexes. And just with the spinal cord, just like with the spinal cord reflexes, we have monosynaptic reflex here too, which is basically the proprioceptive reflex of the mastication muscles. Uh, the best known example is the masseteric reflex because this is the one that neurologists also uh, examine. And just like with the spinal cord reflexes, you will have to be able to list the parts of the, the reflex starting with the receptor, then the efferent uh, nerve, then the central connections, the efferent pathway, and finally the effector. So here, uh, in this case, the receptor is obviously, just like with any other proprioceptive reflex, the masseteric muscle, spindle of the masseteric muscle. And then uh, the uh, afferent nerve is the trigeminal nerve, the mandibular branch, and uh, that goes to the uh, uh, mesencephalic nucleus of the trigeminal nerve. Remember that it is like a ganglion positioned in the central nervous system. It has pseudo-unipolar uh, nerve cell bodies and the central process goes to uh, the pontine nucleus or principal nucleus uh, uh, of the, sorry, the motor nucleus in the pons motor nucleus of the trigeminal nerve and then the monosynaptic reflex is closed and obviously the efferent is also going with the trigeminal nerve, the motor branch to the muscle. So this is the uh, monosynaptic reflex of the brainstem and uh, there are many polysynaptic reflexes in the brainstem. Uh, these we already talked about when we did the reticular formation all the reflexes with the respiratory, cardiac centers, cardiovascular centers, vomiting, uh, coughing, swallowing, these are all brainstem polysynaptic reflexes. And the last group of reflexes are the facial reflexes, when the facial nerve is involved, closing the eye uh, is involved. Cornea reflex is something that neurologists again uh, examine. Uh, here the afferent is obviously the sensory nerve, so the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve. Um, you touch the cornea, which is very sensitive, and the response is uh, eye closure. Or, uh, everybody knows if, um, if, if you go outside or suddenly light is shining in your eyes, you close your eye. In this case, the afferent is obviously the light information through uh, the optic nerve and then uh, in both cases facial nerve is the efferent part uh, and then we have a reflectory closing of the eye, orbicularis uh, opening muscle. If the light is not that strong then you just simply close the eye with the papebra part. If the light is very strong uh, then you strongly close your eyes with the orbital part. And in the last few minutes, i just like to touch some clinical conditions. Uh, these are interesting clinical relations. Uh, these won't be asked in the exam. Uh, only the facial nerve palsy that I mentioned is going to be asked in detail. I just want you to see that uh, even later, these positions where the pathways and the nuclei are can be very important because depending on which part of the brainstem is lesioned, uh, will determine the symptoms. So here you can see, for example, the medial medullary syndrome, which you will learn in uh, neurology. You know which uh, tracts or nuclei are in the medial part of the medulla, hypoglossal nucleus, medial lemniscus and the pyramids, and this determines uh, the, uh, the symptoms of the patient or uh, the lateral medullary symptom, 
uh, syndrome or Wallenberg syndrome when the lateral part of the medulla is lesioned because of a, a posterior inferior cerebral artery uh, uh, thrombosis. And uh, for example, <coughs> so in this part of the medulla, we have many pathways and nuclei, and this explains why we have the, this combination of these symptoms. Or locked in syndrome, which now studying the pathways going through the brainstem, you can understand that <coughs> uh, the sensory pathways at the level of the pons are completely separated. Uh, from the motor pathways, from the pyramidal tract. So there can be uh, a lesion, a level of a lesion, uh, a level of the lesion when the motor tracts are all damaged, the sensory tracts are intact. And if it happens in the pons, then only the oculomotor and trochlear nerves are going to be intact, which are positioned in the mesencephalon. So basically these patients uh, are conscious they feel everything, so pain also, uh, but cannot move anything except for the eye. So this is why it's called locked in, because they are kind of locked in their own body. And uh, also a horrible disease is ALS or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, which affects the motor neurons in the spinal cord and in the brainstem. So basically these patients um, are not able to move anything uh, and it's usually ascending so they can just like in the case of Stephen Hawking uh, he could still move his eyes which is in the upper most part of the brainstem. With this I would like to thank you for the attention.